So my, my name is Michael Edgel, and I am an Arizona attorney. And I know we've got some geographical diversity here. So um, some of what I say may be Arizona specific. And you may hear me repeat to check your local laws a lot, because a lot of this is localized too. Um, so there may be some additional steps you have to take if you, know, you see something during the presentation that you want to take action on. But like I said before, I know some people weren't in here. This is actually like my neighborhood. I, li I live at Thomas and 46th Street, so just south of here, five minutes. Work just west of here, seven minutes, and have been in the neighborhood for 16 years. And just go to church up at Camelback Bible Church at Camelback. It's actually Stanford, which is north of Camelback on 40th Street. Been going there since law school. Been practicing law for 21 years. When I got out of law school, I went to um, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office and was a prosecutor. So when I was in high school, I was in theaters, kind of a theater nerd, did mock trial, and um, needed somewhere, I guess, to d divert that interest. And my dad said, you know, you should look at being a lawyer. So here I am. <laughs> but, and that's the, going into prosecution and going to criminal law gets you in the courtroom really fast. Um, so you know, you go, you're, you're in court basically day one. and and they have a really good training program. So I got some good courtroom experience. After a few years, though, I transitioned to the civil side of the practice. So I went from criminal to civil. Went in with a big firm. After a year or two, year or two got into labor and employment law. And so I've been doing that for the last um, 13 years. And about six years ago, transitioned from the big firm to a smaller firm. So I was with a national firm called Lewis Brisboy. It's a defense litigation firm, so defending employers from employment law claims, litigation. Um, and then transition to Schmidt Schneck. And it's a small local firm. We've got about 12 attorneys. Two of them spoke yesterday. We have a church and ministry law group. And um, my practice tr changed a little bit, going from a big litigation firm to a smaller firm. So I still do some labor and employment litigation, but a lot more of it is counseling. And so working with clients to help them with policies and procedures, do a lot of handbook work, employment contracts, helping them through the termination process and things like that. Um, I also do some adoption work. And that was because we have an adoption practice going back decades and um, kind of had been handed down over the years. And the attorney who was handling it when I came in, she was going out on maternity leave. And so someone needed to pick it up. I said, that sounds great. So you adopted your practice. Exactly. Yeah. I've said that many times. Um, and her paralegal. So, you know, you know, you need a good, good paralegal. So, she, you know, she's been doing it for two decades. So I do some adoption work in addition to labor and employment. I still do a little bit of litigation. And then um, some estate planning. So when you're at a small firm, estate planning is a good side practice to have. So I've been really blessed to have that um, come along as well. So that's a little bit about me. I'm going to say a little bit more about me in just a second. Um, but I'll, I'll give an overview first. So here are the general topics we'll be covering during this talk. I think it's always good to start with why have a handbook. So we'll cover some, some reasons why you should have a handbook. Often overlooked policies or policies that you know you should take a second look at make sure they're in your handbook. So some core policies that I see are missed from time to time. And then we'll talk about kind of a 2022 update, um, emerging legal issues that are impacting employer policies. So this is, I'm going to have to shift over here for a second because I need to control the computer. So. Um, so I said I was going to say a little bit more about myself. It's weird. I'll stand up for a little bit here. Um, so I had this surreal experience last night of getting to watch my two high schoolers in a performance of Oklahoma. And I say surreal because 30 years ago this spring, I was in Oklahoma <laughs> in high school. And so my daughter, who is 14 and a freshman, my son, who's 16 and a sophomore, uh, both tried out. They both got the ensemble. Um, which was great for them. It's their first production. And um, so my daughter, very artsy, very, 
you know, into choir and outgoing. So I knew she would fit in and do really well. My son was a little more reluctant, but being kind of a theater nerd in high school, I was always like, you, you should try it. You at least should try it because it's, it's the most amazing thing I've ever done. Um, some of the most amazing experiences are being on stage. So, and, and Oklahoma was my, I always say it was like the pinnacle of my acting career. Because I was, if you've seen it, I was Will Parker. So I was the kind of B lead. Um, and it was a tremendous amount of fun. So I got to see them perform. And especially my son, who was reluctant, was one of the most outgoing um, members of the ensemble. He was just really, really into it. And my daughter did fantastic. So um, this is how I. do fantastic today. Oh, thank you. I hopefully won't ramble too long. But this is, hopefully, this won't be super loud. I'm going to take it down because it sounds loud. OK. But this is how I felt this morning. So I threw this in here. Um, I'll take it up just a little bit. Not this part, but at the end of the play, you know, all the other students come rushing up on stage. So I had my like little Mr. Miyagi moment. <laughs> you know, they're celebrating, their kid, friends are hugging. I can't even get up on stage because it's just fun. And that's me. <laughs> So I had a little gif there, too, in case that didn't work. So they did it. They embraced it. It was an amazing experience for them, and so it was a lot of fun. Um, so why have handbooks? Um, this is, like I said, this is where we'll start. I don't know if it's a, a misperception, but I, it's always an you know, something interesting, I think sometimes clients think that they're legally required, but there's no legal requirement for a handbook, certainly federally. I'm not aware of any um, states that have a legal requirement for a handbook, but it's, it's a great idea. And I think if you're an employer of any size whatsoever, except for maybe, you know, a true mom and pop that's just employing family members, that you should have a handbook. And it's very important, of course, to set and explain workplace expectations. And so to communicate those expectations to the employee, but then also that the employee has expectations of how you will perform as well as the employer. So, you know, obviously workplace conduct is an important expectation to set. But then in the mind of the employee, the expectation of when am I going to get paid? What are my holidays? Yeah. What are the leave policies? Um, where can I go to report things? Things like that. So obviously very important. And especially with an audience like this, where we're talking about religious organizations, it's an important tool to communicate values. And so um, you know, to have that value statement in there, to tie it into a statement of faith, which is something that I know Alliance Defending Freedom, which we've got a relationship with here because they're here in Arizona and we know those attorneys. Um, I think they've been out there on the forefront in terms of developing a statement of faith and integrate, integrating that into your employment documents. That's something important to have signed as a, as a freestanding document, but you can tie that into your employee handbook too in case if it ever got missed. So getting those values out there and answering common questions. So that's the employee expectations. You know, what are our holidays? What days do I get off? Like I said, what are the pay days? What is the dress code? And then importantly as well is that certain policies will provide employers with a legal defense. And so we'll get into that in a little more detail. So here is the important policies kind of mini, mini audit section. So these are very important policies to make sure are in your handbook. 
And um, so the first is the at will employment presumption. So at will is basically the presumption that the employee employer employment relationship, that relationship can be terminated at any time by the employee or the employer with or without notice for good cause or with no cause. And so the at will presumption, which is enforced here in Arizona, like I said, as the employer, you can terminate that relationship with good cause. So some sort of performance deficiency or some other, you know, business related reason or for no cause, really. You just don't like that they're a fan of a particular team. That's always kind of the joke. Um, or you don't like the color of their tie that day. So good cause, no cause. But you can't do it for bad cause. So that's the, the third category. So that'd be like a discriminatory reason or retaliation, something like that. So it's important to have that provision in your handbook. I typically see it, and if I'm drafting one, you'll put it at the beginning. So kind of have the nice introduction. It's a good place for the at-will employment presumption because it's, it's basically setting the table for that employment relationship. So it makes sense. Do that at the front. Then you have that built into your acknowledgment as well. So the acknowledgment they sign at the end, you can put in the at will language. You want to have something in there that says this employment agreement is not a contract. And so there was a series of cases that came out probably 20, 25 years ago where um, there were disputes over whether, based on the language of an employee, hand employee handbook, whether it constituted an actual binding contract that locked the employer into taking certain actions. And so there were some cases that came down that said, based on the way it was drafted, because of the terms it was drafted, that it created a contract. And so having a disclaimer in your handbook which states, this document is not a contract, is important. And so again, I'd like to put that at the beginning near the at-will employment presumption and that's common. I, I think if you had a, a template that you're using from the last few years, you know, number one and number two will probably be in there. But it's definitely good to check. To kind of piggyback off the not a contract, even though those disclaimers are in there, something important to think about, again, is the language that you're using throughout the, contra the, con the handbook or the provisions you're putting in there and whether or not they could be perceived to be contractual. So the most common example is going to be a progressive discipline policy that is too rigid. And so that, that's actually what a lot of those cases kind of grew out of, is there were these handbook policies that had very rigid progressive discipline policies. So it was like step one, verbal warning, step two, written warning, step three, submitted to the employee committee. Step th so there was really no discretion built into the progressive discipline policy. And so if the employer deviated from that, and so let's say it's a first infraction and they just terminated the employee, these courts were turning around and saying, well, this is a con the way you've got it written is, is that this is mandatory, um, you know, very rigid policy. You have to follow it. You broke the policy. You breached the contract, which was the the handbook. So that's always something that I look at when I'm reviewing these handbooks is how rigid is their progressive discipline policy. And you see it with churches because I think sometimes churches want to mirror kind of the spiritual discipline procedures from the Bible. So just be aware of that and try to build in some discretion in there. So. It's okay to have progressive discipline, but you want to make sure you have a statement in there that says uh, the employer can deviate from this policy at any time and can terminate employees at any time, whether it's a first infraction, second infraction. Because it happens. You, you may have an infraction that's so serious that you, you just know you have to end the employment relationship, or you have a lot of little things that build up. and kind of the writings on the wall, you know this person doesn't fit in, they're not doing well, or it's a culture clash. And so then you get to that first point of discipline. And I just had a call probably a couple weeks ago from a church, and they <clears throat> it was that same thing. It was, 
you know, this person is just not fitting into this role. It was just a fit issue. And then she had this discipline issue. And so I was getting the call and she said, um, you know, the business administrator, she's like, Michael, can I, can I just fire them? <laughs> it's not fitting. It's not a good fit. And now we've had this infraction. And I said, yeah, you can, you can fire them. As long as there's not an employment contract outside of the handbook, um, you could terminate them at this point. So, um, and that reminds me, I should go back to point number one. So the at will presumption, that's the legal presumption, right? Um, it doesn't even have to be written in your handbook necessarily. You can, if you didn't have a handbook, that would be the presumption. The way that presumption goes away is if you have an employment contract with the person. So you can change the presumption through an, an employment contract that says, okay, I'm gonna hire you as employer. Employee, I'm gonna hire you for a set term and I can terminate you under these conditions and then here's what happens. You know, maybe there's a severance clause. Usually that's worked in. So if you've set specific conditions under which someone can be terminated, that then throws the at-will employment presumption out the window, even if you have it in your handbook. So something to keep in mind. So discrimination and harassment procedures, you want to make sure those are in a handbook. So really, three and four excuse me, four and five, when I was talking about certain legal defenses that are bolstered by your handbook, that's what I was referring to. So, of course, as religious organizations, Title VII, which is the federal um, discrimination, uh, hostile work environment protective statute, which is nationwide, Title VII, religious organizations are exempt from the prohibition against religious discrimination. So you can discriminate based on religion. You can hire people of your religion. So when it comes to number four, it's important when you're reviewing your handbook to make sure that your discrimination policy is consistent with your practices. So if you only hire people of your religion, make sure that that's stated in there so you don't, you know, if you took a boilerplate from some other template, it's gonna have, we don't, we don't discriminate on the basis of religion. If you do, you want to make sure that you call that out. And you can even re reference Title VII in that exemption. I have a question on that. Yeah. Are you able to then fire people based off of religion as well? Let's say they came in as a Christian and left as something that then started practicing something else. So you can let them go based off that as well. Yeah. Okay. You want to make sure that it's not just like a hiring thing, but like, let's, you know, they become a Buddhist working with you and you're like, oh, well, um, we can't have you working here anymore, but you can still let them go. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And depending on how complex you want your handbook to be, you could put something in there too. So like I said, there's a, sometimes there is, um, I saw it in a church. It's a big church that a big handbook, but it was like a Christian lifestyle policy. It said, this is what we expect. And it's of course tied into the statement of faith. And they have employees sign the statement of faith annually. So they're, they're reaffirming each year. So in case they, they do change their position on something, um, hopefully that would come out during that process. And then, if, like I said, depending on how kind of complicated you want to be, you could even put something in there that said, you know, this is what, this is the doctrine we expect you to, to abide by and to believe in if that should change you know, let the lead pastor know, let the board of elders know, something like that. So, like I said, religious organizations have that exemption, but they still do have to um, protect employee, employees against discrimination on the basis of the, uh, basis of the other protected categories under Title VII, and of course, age and the ADA. Um, I know with the Bostock decision, you know, the definition of sex has been expanded two years ago. That's where the statement of faith comes in with some of those lifestyle issues, if that's your hiring practice and consistent with your doctrine. That's how that's handled. ADF has a lot of good material on that as well. Um, so complaint procedure and open door. I actually have a separate slide on that to go through. That's, like I said, four and five are key and they go hand in hand. The, the real protection comes with number five. 
when I was talking about legal protections and legal defenses against discrimination and harassment lawsuits, charges that may come up. Actually, it's a charge first and then a lawsuit. So having a complaint procedure has will afford an organization a legal defense if they're ever the recipient of an EEOC charge or an employment discrimination or harassment lawsuit. And so critical to have that in there. And so the reason for that is if the employer has um, preventative measures in their organization to protect against discrimination and harassment, and remedial, so there's two parts, preventative and remedial, then this legal defense is available. So preventative enters into where you have the policies against it. And so that was number four. And then remedial is what you do if it ever arises. So the elements of a complaint procedure, this is the remedial portion of it, is you want to communicate to employees that the employer cares about their concerns. And certainly, if they're is any unwanted action directed against them that they need to report it. It's important that the, it, it be phrased as a duty to report and that it be immediate reporting. And so that's not just the victim, but also witnesses. So if an employee witnesses something, they have a duty to report. You want to have a re reporting mechanism so you want to direct them to report to certain people so it's clear. And you want to have multiple channels of reporting. So I see it's kind of more often than not. It's, it's like report to this one individual. So report to the lead pastor. And if I'm asked to review that and revise that handbook, I'm going to put in other people to report to. Because what if it's the lead pastor? Then they have nowhere to go. Then it doesn't work. So. With churches, I kind of like the elder board because then you've got multiple people that are available. So you may have like business administrator or whoever in the office they should report to. But then alternatively, elder board, alternatively, any manager that you feel comfortable with. So hopefully you've got different genders too because an employee may feel more comfortable reporting to a female. So how to report. I usually don't get too detailed with that. It's just, you know, go make that report. Um, I'm not a big fan of having people fill out forms necessarily. So I guess make the report and then make sure that that gets recorded, of course. So take notes. If they, ha if they have a statement, you can have them write out a statement and sign it. That's a good idea. You want to make sure there are some investigation procedures with some timeline. Um, how is the outcome going to be communicated? And then a further review or an appeal is not a bad idea. So if they're dissatisfied with the outcome, maybe they have one more avenue to pursue. So if they report it to the business administrator, they don't like it, maybe the elder board would take that up and review it. It would really be up to the organization and how they'd like to handle it. Okay. So. Maybe best to go to district most of the time. Yeah, district is where we and Bill is best to go. And if not, then you go to synodical, which is uh, St. Louis. So. so the other one, if we pop back up. So the last one, this one is, this one's like the stealth policy a lot of people don't know about. <clears throat> It's the, um, so FLSA is the Fair Labor Standards Act. And most of these pictures are intentionally cheesy. So um, the Fair Labor Standards Act is the federal law that governs uh, minimum wage and overtime regulations. And so. Can you, are you going to go into some of that stuff, with, uh, like how much vacation, sick hours, any of that later on? Or? Should I wait to ask that yeah, there's a section on PTO and sick time. Okay. okay. So, yeah. That's helpful. Because I was like, that was one of the big reasons why I Hopefully I can. You were like, oh, there, there is yeah. the, the, the bullet point. And 
Well, here's, so FL, FLSA safe harbor provision. So again, Fair Labor Standards Act governs overtime and minimum wage for employees. And of course, there are two classifications of employees under the FLSA. You have those that are not exempt. And so those are employees who get paid hourly and they're due, not necessarily hourly, but actually you can pay them a salary. But if they work more than 40 hours a week, they're entitled to overtime. But typically they're going to be hourly. Um, and th whatever their salary averages out to has to be the minimum wage. So uh, then you have the exempt employees. And so we won't get too much into the weeds between the two classifications, because that's like a class in, of, in and of itself. But just generally, your exempt employees, to, to be designated exempt, there are two tests. There's a duties test, and then there's a salary test. And so under the duties phase, and this is, got, this is probably a little too deep, actually, but I just want to set the table. So your exempt employees are going to be your administrative employees, professional employees, um, your executive employees. So those employees with those duties, so they meet the duties tests under the Department of Labor. So you, you need to go and actually look at the elements of the, the different duties to make sure they fit. It's important. And then make sure they're paid a salary of at least $684 per week, which just, that just got bumped up like two years ago. Is that really just Arizona or is that? That's nationwide. nationwide. Yeah. I knew it applied here, but <clears throat> so that means the employee's exempt from overtime. Like I would be like a professional, and so I don't get paid overtime because I get paid a salary. Um, and I, if I work more than forty hours a week, that's just covered by the salary. Um, so that's the breakdown, just to kind of like I said, set the table. So for your exempt employees, and again, it, there's two parts to the test because some people think, some employers will think, well. If the employee wants to be paid a salary and I want to pay them a salary, we agree on that, then I don't have to pay them overtime. That's not true. You have to make sure that they, you satisfy that duties test as well. So all that to say for your handbooks, there's a safe harbor provision. Because if you have an exempt employee who's being paid a salary, um, this only applies to the exempt employees. Employers cannot make any improper salary deductions. So when you think of proper deductions, you've got like you know your taxes, insurance that they've signed up for, um, retirement programs that they've signed up for, other legal deductions that are made. Um, an employer cannot make any improper deductions without jeopardizing that exempt status and potentially the exempt status of other employees in their class. Now, if, if you screw up once, it's probably not going to be a big deal, but oftentimes it's not going to be like one mistake. It'll happen over time. If the DOL gets wind of it, like I said, it's possible that you could lose the exempt status, and then now you're looking at, well, how many hours did they work, and we have to pay all this back over time, and it becomes a big mess. The DOL sniffing around and everything. Um, but if you have a safe harbor policy within the handbook, it's basically like a get out of jail free card. And so that'll hopefully placate the Department of Labor. And basically what it says is, hey, employee, we will not make any, um, and there's a DOL fact sheet. You could Google this too. That lays out the elements. Um, so it says, employee, we, it's our policy not to make improper deductions. You have to have a reporting mechanism. So. If you see any improper deductions from your paycheck or anything you have questions on, please report it to someone specifically. Uh, we will investigate that. We will pay you back any improper deductions. And we will make a good faith attempt to fix this issue going forward. It's basically like five elements to it. Um, it's pretty specific. so. Good to, good to throw into the handbook because, like I said, it's a get-out-of-jail-free get card. They don't care what your intent was in making the improper deduction. So it could be a, a simple accident. So that's, oh, there's the elements right there I put in there. Okay. 
So you've got a policy against it, complaint mechanism, good faith commitment to take future corrective action, and reimburse for improper deductions. So those were the six you know, important policies to look at, some stealth policies in there. So this is the part of the presentation where we we'll shift and kind of look at emerging issues for handbooks and things that um, some employees haven't, or excuse me, employers may not have considered. So I think a health and safety policy is something that a lot more employers are taking a look at, especially, especially coming off, hopefully, the pandemic. So take a look at health and safety policies and make sure you've got one in place. And it's, it's always good. This even goes back to like the discrimination um, reporting policies. I, you want to present yourself as an employer that's looking out for the employees, um, that is doing things in good faith. Because we talked about how there are those legal defenses for those specific policies. But if you're ever in a legal dispute, you know, the handbook is going to kind of be a window into the heart of the organization. And so um, if you're looking out for the health and safety, if you're looking out to making a good work environment for employees, you're going to look better to a judge or a jury or an investigator. And you're going to show that, hey, maybe mistakes happen, but we really do try to do the right thing by employees. So in a, a commitment to keeping the workplace safe is, is important. And then similar to the reporting obligations under the discrimination and harassment, making an affirmative obligation on employees to follow workplace rules regarding safety, making an affirmative obligation on employees to keep the work area free of potential hazards. Those are good elements to have in a policy. If you have a workplace safety policy that is campus-wide or organization-wide, the handbook's a great place for it. But you can have location-specific policies, too. So, you know, if you've got a maintenance area, you can post policies there. But make sure that employees know from the handbook that it's their responsibility to keep it safe, keep the workplace safe. There should be a reporting mechanism. And so employees must report unsafe conditions, who to report to. And when it comes to, to COVID-19, I know things just over the last few months have, have changed. As the HR lawyer for the firm, I'm in charge of updating those policies. So whenever the CDC changes something or Maricopa County changes something, you know, I, I, it kind of flows from CDC to the local agencies. And so I usually go to Maricopa County because that's where we are. For the COVID-19, I thought it was easier to keep it outside the handbook. So we're not updating the handbook all the time. Yeah. Yeah, updating it all the time. Yeah, I didn't that Yeah, I didn't want to have to keep going back into the handbook and doing that. So we kept it outside and then just would email updates out to staff or do trainings periodically. So, yeah, it's a good idea just keep an, an update, keep an eye on the changing policies. Um, and I know you guys are from different parts of the country, I feel like I feel like things have been back to normal in Arizona for at least a year. Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> like they, Governor Ducey, I think it was in April, did away with the mask mandates. So, yeah, I haven't worn a mask since April, unless unless like I specifically have to to go into some place. Um, everything. I think ours was down for 30 to 45 days at one point in 2020, but other than that. Yeah, and I, we were really fortunate because our schools, my kids went back to school fall of 2020. So that felt like, once that happened, it was like pretty much back to normal, felt like. So remote work, telework, this has been a big issue over the last few years. You know, employers pretty much had a, you know, had whiplash and just, you know, had to react to changing conditions and sending people home without really having policies in place. 
and now employee expectations are different in terms of this. And it's funny, I have a friend that I've known through church for years, and she wants to come and, you know, she wants to get a job. Her kids are getting older. And so she's like, hey, can I come and work at the firm? I was like, I, you know, I'd actually been thinking of her. I thought she'd be a great fit. Um, but she's like, yeah, I'd like to work one day a week in the office, and then I'd like to work at home the rest of the time. I was like, um, because we do have like a admin position open that backs up our office manager, but I was like, whoa, um, I don't know if that, <laughs> yeah. It just seemed weird to like dictate that from the outset. Um, so, so I, keep, I think you pretty much have to be in to do the admin stuff. <laughs> so in thinking through these remote work issues, you wanna think through, okay, the hiring and orientation process. You know, how do you onboard someone who's just going to be working at home or working at home most of the time? If you have um, one of those positions that can be telework or in the office, as the pandemic hopefully ramps down, you know there are other reasons why employees might need to flex and work at home. So it could be lifestyle, it could be an ADA accommodation. You know there are other reasons for that. So. What would be the approval process for allowing someone to flex at home? It's something to at least think through, and if it makes sense to have a policy to put that in place. What are the expectations for those who can work at home? Um, how is their performance going to be re reviewed? Uh, when are they expected to be available? How do they keep track of time if they are hourly? You got to think through security concerns. So your information technology, how do you protect that? Who provides the equipment when they're working at home? So those are things to think through and if you want to put a policy in place. I think this is important. You want to clearly define at some point which positions would be ineligible for work from home. So our receptionist, yeah, that's just not a position they can work from home. So job descriptions would be a great way to do that. But I know it's really hard. Like, you, you've worked so hard on a handbook, and then you think about, well, I got to go through and do job descriptions and have all this paperwork. And it seems really onerous to over paperwork everything. But I think in this instance, if you do have job do, job descriptions, that that's a great a great way to to define what would be a remote work position. Because kind of like the COVID policy, positions change and evolve and the names change. I don't know if you want to be updating your handbook all the time for that. So this is a big issue, cybersecurity. I don't think that people often think about it or organizations. And we certainly didn't as a law firm. <clears throat> but we had one of our, actually Bob Brown, who spoke here yesterday, was really big on cybersecurity. And so he was always pushing us to kind of reevaluate what we do. And so I kind of, I put insurance last, but I'm gonna kind of start by talking about insurance. It's important as organizations to check what your cybersecurity insurance coverage is because it's probably woefully inadequate. And that's what we found out last year and, you know, Bob said it was almost malpractice on the part of our insurance broker that they weren't pushing us to get more insurance because it was, it was like the minimum kind of rider on a general liability policy. And when you think about, you know, obviously the key question here is how much damage could be, um, how much damage it would be if, if you were hit by a hacker or ransomware. So for a law firm, more than a religious organization, you know, the damage can be a lot greater. So we have to have higher insurance coverage, but still a good conversation to have with your broker. So like I said, we were woefully underinsured. So we, we hiked it, we got separate insurance and, and really increased it. And you think about, so I know that different organizations handle different things. You know, for us, the liability was, well, if we get shut down for two days or a week while we're dealing with a hack, you know, we're going to be not able to generate revenue during that time. So that's going to be a major point of damage that we would need insurance for. 
probably not as big a concern for religious organizations, but um, also we have client confidential information that can be ransomed or exploited. So we have downstream damage that could happen if they steal our client information and then attack our clients somehow. Mm -hmm. Or donor information, yeah. So those are things to think about. And again, ins t calling your insurance company, your broker is the first step just to make sure. Say, hey, I want to have an evaluation here. What do you recommend? Here's the information we have. What's really weird too, so we had a cybersecurity audit. We hired a company. We got the insurance. Um, and getting the insurance was interesting. So to apply for the insurance, they said, okay, this is where it dovetails with policies finally, is they said, um, before we'll insure you, you have to have these like three policies in your handbook. And so it had to do with um, basically employees' use of cell phones and what do we do with basically, um, you know, like iPads and phones and laptops and things. So that technology that's portable. So we, have, we had to put some policies in place right away just to get the coverage. So your policies are often going to be driven by your insurance coverage. Um, and there's two focuses here. So there's a de device-focused policies to consider and then user-focused policies. So on the device-focused policy, you've got to think about, OK, well, how are the employees, you know, what technology is being used? Is, it, is the employer? providing the technology, or is it the employee who's using their phone or their own laptop to access our information? And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Also, some sort of device management infrastructure. Like, we're, we're kind of too small for that, but for big organizations, there are software platforms that would allow employers to control devices and kind of basically um, standardize the interface across all devices, be able to remotely shut down things. Then there are user-focused policies. So training employees, risk prevention. Training is important. When we did the cybersecurity audit, that's one thing they're going to help us with is employee training. So um, avoiding phishing scams and email scams, things like that um, is very, very important. Funny enough, like when we were in the middle of that cybersecurity audit, our neighbor, who is a law firm, it's like a two attorney law firm, got hit with ransomware. And it shut down their law firm. Like, they just couldn't access anything. So that was eye opening. And we were, we were glad we were just a little bit ahead of them in terms of being proactive. So this dove, dovetails with the cybersecurity. For most religious organizations, certainly smaller employees or employers, this isn't going to be that important. But something to think about is a bring your own device to work. This is going to be more important for employers that have um, proprietary information, confidential information that they need to keep secure. And so you'd want to have a policy in place that sets the terms for employees using their own technology, so their phones, their laptops, and how they interface with the employer's network, and how information that gets on those personal devices would be handled. So in some important elements would be a no expectation of privacy for employer-related information. Since it is their own device, there is an expectation of privacy. And unless you put them on notice that there isn't, um, if at some point as an employer you wanted to access that device or you know review information on that that's related to the organization's functions and they didn't let you or refuse that, it would be difficult to get access to the device. So you want to make sure you've got something in there that says no expectation of privacy. But it's their device, so it's going to be tailored to just the employer-related information. So that email account or that Dropbox that has employer information in it. The employer can monitor use without further notice. And if there's a security breach, that the employer could wipe the device. 
like I said, if, if your you know, facilities director uses his cell phone you know, to coordinate work during the day and send some emails, this, this wouldn't apply to him. You know, he's, there isn't sensitive information or sensitive communications going on. But if, if you've got a finance director who's got sensitive financial information at home, you might want to give this a look. And just generally speaking, employer, employee privacy when it comes to the workplace is always a balancing of interests. So the legitimate employer interest versus a reasonable expectation of privacy. And so, um, of course, you know, the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment against, you know, protection against unreasonable search and seizure doesn't apply to private employers. Uh, but there are certain privacy protections that private individuals have. Like I said, it's not a constitutional right, but it's more of like a general common law right. And if an employer were to breach those privacy rights, an employee could have a cause of action against the employer. Um, and all of that is defined by that, the balancing of those two interests. And so it's important in employee handbooks to state where there is not an expectation of privacy. So even though the default is, if we give you the computer, that's the employer's computer, you don't have an expectation of privacy in that. I would state that in the handbook. I'd also state that you don't have an expectation of privacy in your desk, you know, you know basically the work area. Uh, where they do would obviously be like locker rooms and bathrooms and things like that. That's generally where that's defended and protected. Um, but that balancing is dependent on notice provi provisions and handbooks. So, um, so even like someone's purse, you'd have a reasonable expectation of privacy. I don't think that your, um, you know, like your neighborhood church could institute a policy where, okay, every day you come in, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna, we'll wand you down, and we're gonna search your personal items for security reasons. Unless there was a legitimate employer interest, a legitimate security concern, um, or like a, a workplace investigation where, okay, you know, the offering bag was stolen. These six people <laughs> had access to it. We're, we're going to look through this pursuant to the workplace investigation. Um, but there's, there's kind of, a, like I said, a balance there, and it's very fact specific. But your handbook plays a role in that. So here's where we get to some leave policies and different considerations. Um, so PCL, PSL is paid sick leave. There is no federal paid sick leave law. There's no federal entitlement to paid sick leave. And I think when labor interests get frustrated at the federal level, they shift to the state level. And so what you've seen is states have been passing these sick leave laws when they can. Arizona passed one by voter referendum, because it never would have gotten through our legislature. But they, we have this voter referendum process, so they got it on the ballot, and it passed back in 2016. It went into effect in 2017. And it's a little bit of a wacky law. Um, and so there was this like period of kind of like employers not knowing what to do and trying to figure out this policy. And the Industrial Commission of Arizona put out this like 60 page like question and answer form that you really had to read to understand how this worked. So all that to say is know if your state has a paid sick leave requirement. There was one for a brief period of time during COVID, but that's lapsed now. Um, so see what it is, review, your, review that law. If it's complicated like ours, you probably need a lawyer to look at it. And Make sure you're in compliance with your state paid sick leave law. You should have PTO and paid sick leave policies in your handbook. Definitely put those in your handbook. They're important. Paid time off thing becomes an issue. I, I guess uh, according to state law here in Arizona, there's no requirement to give people time off or to pay them for time off. Mm -hmm. So that's always a kind of a 
fuzzy area in terms of trying to put it in the handbook. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's an employee benefit and there's no legal right to it. It just becomes kind of do you want to be a competitive employer and a good employer? <clears throat> I mean, we came up with something which may or may not be an issue elsewhere, but uh, some one of our office staff announced that she was taking vacation at Christmas time, and the pastor said, "No, you're not," and it became a, a big issue, mm -hmm. which which we eventually resolved. But it really sort of said legally, I don't know that there's any way to work that out. Well, that's where policies can come into play. So, having that, setting that expectation, that you know, I've seen policies that say, yeah, during the holidays, we're tight on because churches have a lot of programs going on, so we can't grant leave during that time for certain employees. Uh, and then the, it's making it subject to supervisor approval. Obviously, employees should expect that, but putting it in the handbook makes it an easier you, pill to swallow. Say it's not a contract. So, yeah. where, did, where does it leave the pastor of the church in terms of saying, hey, I'm not going to approve this, or I, I, it's kind of an arbitrary decision, in my opinion? Well, I definitely put it into, yeah, it can be arbitrary, but it, you could say subject to, base, subject to employer approval based upon organizational needs, organizational requirements. So some emergent PTO issues are employees who haven't been able to take vacation because of travel restrictions may be carrying a lot of PTO into 2022. So having some flexibility in working with those employees, um, generally like a use it or lose it policy is going to be a, uh, acceptable in most states. There's a couple of states that have outlawed it or moda restricted use it or lose it procedures. I think it's Montana and, of course, California. So, like, I just stay away from California. It's so, <laughs> um, we have some clients who have offices in California, so it gets really complicated. But, but I would say, I would just say, have some flexibility. This is something that you know maybe they've earned, um, and if they banked a lot of it, try to work with them. A couple of options would be to pay it out, like cash it out or have them spread it out over a couple of years just so they don't lose it because um, it really wasn't their fault. So temporary modification of policy should be considered. You want to know your state law requirements. <clears throat> An interesting issue is whether or not paid time off is considered wages in your state. In Arizona, it's kind of a gray area and it depends on how your handbook is drafted or on your practices. So in Arizona, um, wages are defined as compensation that the employee has a reasonable expectation to receiving. And so how is that reasonable expectation created? It could be created by the handbook or it could be created through the pattern and practice of the employer. And they may contradict each other. Handbook may say one thing, but we do, we do this too. In that case, you know, whatever benefits the employee is what you're going to have to do, but try to be consistent. But that's something to, to look at. So when I'm drafting a handbook, I work with the client and I say, well, how do you want to treat PTO? If you make it um, basically, you know, that, that they're guaranteed to it, um, that they get it paid out, then it's going to be considered wages and you're going to have to pay it out. Um, if you say, if you have a use it or lose it policy, then it's generally not going to be considered wages at that point. And so you might be thinking, like, what, is, what does it mean if it's considered wages or not? Well, there's, Arizona has a wage act. So if an employee isn't paid their wages within a certain period of time, then they can file a lawsuit under the wage act. So they would be able to file a, a lawsuit. So your state may have something similar. So have it reviewed. That's probably something a little more complicated, so you probably want to call your um, attorney if you have one, if you haven't had it reviewed in a while. So marijuana is our last topic, but with, did you have PTO questions? Yeah, it's more along the lines of like how they, you 
you said like uh, depending on the state, uh, sick time is you know, sometimes better than necessity. Um, but like, how did like they work forty hours a week? Are you supposed to give them eight vacation hours that month, or is it, like, or you, can you make it in the employee handbook that like if you in your first year of working here you get five vacation days and five sick days? Is there like a, a way that you have to like keep track of how it it, it can build it up or whatnot? I wasn't sure if there's like a legal policy on that. <clears throat> not in Arizona. Okay. So you'd have to check your local, okay. you know, state there, laws. There is but a sick leave requirement in yeah, that's the only caveat is the sick, there is a mandatory amount of accrued sick leave. And you can combine the sick leave and the PTO. So as long as your PTO covers the sick leave requirements in Arizona, you don't have to have two separate buckets. You can just have one. So that might be the only caveat for your state too. But there isn't like a nationwide requirement. And that was the biggest so. thing that I wanted to make sure is there wasn't a federal thing, I guess, that we were disobeying. Yeah, nothing like that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, expanded marijuana legalization has been an issue for a number of years. I think in Arizona, medical marijuana was passed by voter initiative in 2010. And so 2011 was the first year employers had to deal with it. But medical marijuana is legal in 34 states. <coughs> Recreational is legal in 19 states and in DC, including Arizona. So that was just passed in 2020. Narrowly lost in 2018. And so it was like writings on the wall. This is going to happen in 2020. Everyone knew it. So if you haven't done it in a while, it's good to take a look at your drug testing policies and uh, drug-free workplace policies. So we'll go through some issues that could come up. Here are the states in case you have any questions. So this is where recreational and medical is legalized. And then just medical. So over there is Arizona's medical marijuana card. So they actually sign up through the Department of Health and get issued a card. So they're card holders under the law. I think for those states that have medical and recreational, that if there's you know any sort of registration requirement requirements for medical are going to drop off. Because why, th why jump through the hoops anymore of having to sign up and get a prescription and everything? That's actually a good thing in Arizona. Um, because I'll talk about it actually probably right now. Um, yeah, I can jump ahead. So down here, medical marijuana and anti-retaliation laws. So a lot of the medical marijuana statutes have uh, restrictions on the ability for an employer to take adverse employment action based on the employee's status as a cardholder in the case of Arizona. So they're a registered cardholder. So employers cannot, um, well, it's actually discrimination, not retaliation. So can't discriminate against the cardholder on the basis of them being a cardholder. So if they apply for a job and it comes out that they're a marijuana cardholder, the employer can't use that as a basis to not hire them, can't use it as a basis to fire them or demote them or do anything bad to them. Nor can an employer take an adverse employment action against a cardholder if they test positive. So if there's like a random drug screen in the workforce and the cardholder tests positive, just the mere fact that they test positive, you cannot take an adverse employment action against them. So. Something to be aware of for that medical bucket of employees who fall in that is be aware what your state laws say, say in terms of discrimination against them based on their status. Now, there are several fine distinction, distinctions here. I'm going to talk about Arizona for a second. So we just had recreational marijuana become legal. There are no restrictions on employers. It's actually a really good thing. So. Employer, we can take any adverse employment action we want, as long as they're not a cardholder. If it comes out like, hey, yeah, I was using marijuana last night, 
you're fired. You know, the employer, as long as they're not a cardholder, they can fire them, they can do whatever they want, um, essentially. So, and interestingly enough, we'll talk about it too, but what about like accommodations? So ADA accommodations. Arizona's law for recreational use says you do not have to accommodate marijuana use that's related to a disability. It's written into the statute. So pretty interesting. But check your local laws, because mileage may vary. Nevada, I heard, may have, anyone from Nevada? OK, doesn't matter then. I think, like, I, I seem to recall that there may be like an anti-retaliation for recreational use there. So, but even though there are these anti-retaliation provisions built into the medical marijuana law, that doesn't mean that employers have to tolerate possession, use, or impairment at work. So you can still have a drug-free workplace. And I could still fire a card holder if he comes in and he's impaired. Now there's no legal consensus on what impaired means. So like if you're drunk driving, there's basically a legal standard nationwide in terms of what is the legal limit. Marijuana is different, and I don't know the exact you know, biology to it. I know that there are different tests that test for test in different ways. So I think like a blood test will show more recent use, but then there's hair tests and metabolite tests. So you could take a test that shows use that was like a month ago, but that's not going to show impairment at all. So if you think impairment is an issue, what you're looking for is signs and symptoms of impairment. And so that's going to be like bloodshot eyes, lethargic, has the smell on them. Um, so you want to look for actual impaired behavior, physical impairments, mental impairments, if there are anti-retaliation procedures and you think someone has, um, is impaired at work but can't bring it into your workplace, can't use it at work. Even if it's, they have a card, card they need it for paying, or I don't know whatever they need it for, they could prohibit them from doing it at work? Yeah, I, double check your own state. Just California. I, I, okay, I would double check California. <laughs> but, yeah, they could do anything they want. but as far as I know, you can have a drug-free workplace. I, I can't imagine that, there would be a law that says you have to allow them to bring it to work. Like alcohol, you can't yeah. Drink if you're yeah. So also, you know, consider drug testing policies if you don't have one. There are different kinds of drug testing policies depending on the state. Arizona is a more employer-friendly state, so it has an employer-friendly drug testing law, and so. Basically, if you meet the requirements of the law, so you basically cut and paste it into your handbook, then if you take an adverse employment action against an, an employee, so you fire them because of a positive drug test, then you have certain legal defenses under Arizona law. So it gives the employer defenses if they follow the policy. Um, I can imagine there are states that probably have like employee-friendly drug testing laws, which say you cannot drug test unless you do these things. So Arizona is the other way. So take a look, figure out what, you know, if that's an issue that's important to your organization, just see if there's any state laws on the topic. A lot of times with the medical marijuana law, you're going to have something about safety sensitive positions in that law. And so safety sensitive positions. So that's something that's typically going to impact the health and safety of other employees or the health and safety of third parties, so the public. Best practice is to designate the position in advance. So don't wait until the person tests positive and then say, oh, that's safety sensitive. See, it's on this job description I just typed up. If that's something that's important to you, then do an audit ahead of time of your positions and then designate those in writing of what's safety sensitive. Don't overuse it. The big joke is um, with practitioners. There's one in particular who in Arizona does a lot of medical marijuana and marijuana presentations for employment law. Because for whatever reason, he's a really good guy. I like him a lot. 
but he's had a lot of cases, early cases that had to do with it, and they got appealed, and so he kind of became the expert. And so his presentation is entitled, No, the Receptionist is Not a Safety-Sensitive Position. So although in Arizona it's like wide open, you could literally name any position safety-sensitive, uh, but I, would, I wouldn't do it because if it gets challenged, you want to have a good faith reason for doing it. You don't want to be, well, it's because we want to dis discriminate against cardholders. <laughs> so I would I'd really take an audit, make sure it impacts health and safety. Um, and if you've got specific status. Yeah. yeah. If you have somebody in a financial management or control or paycheck or payroll or that sort of thing, wouldn't that be a sensitive position or not? Not, not under, I mean, it, it, it probably fall because Arizona's is really wide open. So I think you could fit it into Arizona, but I would say like health and safety. So someone who's driving, operating machinery, um, okay. caring for children, things like that. It doesn't have to do with job responsibilities. Um, it does, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think financial would fit under that necessarily. Um, but you'd have to see what, so basically what this means in Arizona, safety sensitive, is that you can discriminate against cardholders on the basis of them being a cardholder or a positive drug test because they're safety sensitive. And it, there doesn't have to be a safety issue. It just has to be, no, he's our bus driver. We don't want a cardholder being a bus driver. Arizona also has a statutory list, but then it's open-ended. So I would think it's more likely than not that other states would have it pretty well defined what is a safety sensitive. So you could look that up. So this is the last one. So we'll finish a little bit early. Medical accommodations. So marijuana is still illegal under federal law. So under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Marijuana use is not an accommodation for a disability because it's illegal. Of course, it's going to be decriminalized at some point in the next five years, I would guess. So that will change. But for now, in terms of the Americans with Disabilities Act, there's no obligation to accommodate marijuana use. But different states have different laws on that. So it could be an accommodation in your state, California, probably. Um, I'm trying to think of any other ones. Like Nevada, because it's probably one. Arizona is interesting because they specifically said, no, it's, you do not have to accommodate. Now, you might be thinking, Michael, Michael, you just told us we don't have to under federal law. So how, what other accommodation requir requirements might there be? Uh, a lot of states have mirrored fer federal law with their own anti-discrimination statutes. So Arizona has its version of Title VII, of ADA, of age discrimination. So when they drafted the recreational marijuana statute, they made sure and said, hey, under Arizona law, you do not have to accommodate. So an interesting balance there of interests. So if you encounter marijuana use that is connected to a medical reason, it's good to take an initial um, kind of mental step there and try to see if there is an accommodation issue in your state. So call your church's attorney or you know, do a little bit of legal research if you can. Um, it's amazing what you can, you know, you can find some. Oftentimes I got a question, I'll Google it, and you know, you'll, you'll find an article or something that's pretty helpful. Sometimes that leads to, you know, then I can go into Westlaw and find something a little bit quicker. So, so what are some different accommodations? I can't think that impairment at work would be an accommodation. Um, you know, reduced productivity at work would not, I, I could see that easily being defeated. Um, but accommodation might be time off so they can use marijuana if they're having like their back pain is flaring up or something, or their hip pain. But I'm not, I, I'm, I don't use marijuana. Sick leave, or is that 
You don't have to give them any leave outside of, you wouldn't have to like give them paid leave unless there's some state requirement I don't know about, but under federal law, certainly in Arizona law, if somebody needs time off and they're out of PTO or sick leave, you don't have to give them more paid time, but they could have unpaid leave. And that's where it gets a little bit murky is how much unpaid leave is appropriate. And that's where you get into the reasonable accommodation analysis. Is it an undue hardship? But court after court has said open-ended leave where there's no end in sight is not a reasonable accommodation. But how, so you, that's where an attorney would probably need to get involved and say, okay, for our jurisdiction, what do the cases say? And that's generally a federal issue, but you have different circuit courts with different standards sometimes until it gets ironed out. But Generally speaking, like outside of six months is unreasonable. I definitely recall that from the research. But as far as you, you're saying, you're under no obligation to pay them for whatever time off. They Not if they're out of pay time. Let them exhaust their pay time off. What if they run out of their pay time off and then like, it's not like they're leaving for like six or four months sort of thing and saying, hey, like I'm doing this trip or I'm doing whatever. But it's like, oh, like I missed like a week here and then like another four days here and then like another four days there sort of thing. Like how does that like, legally speaking, like can you let them go because they constantly keep taking unpaid time off in inconvenient times? You can, yeah, it becomes a uh, undue hardship okay. analysis at that point. So you have to look at, okay, what impact is this having on the organization? And that's typically going to be a, like a financial issue. Um, ADA can be one of the hardest things to evaluate because it's so open-ended. So you can have, like there's a pretty much black and white law that an accommodation is not having to hire a second person to do the same job. But an accommodation might be to hire an assistant, you know, for somebody with a physical disability. So there's not often a real clear cut line. So you have to like do some analysis. But in, in that case, yeah, it'd be undue hardship. Uh, and yeah, you're basically looking at the, the financial impact and administrative impact on the organization. Yeah, and that's, that was the biggest thing is like, if it's impacting the organization running basically the way it needs to, can't we just let them go because it's impacting the organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I can't say black or white every situation, but it's, there's, there's some wiggle room there. The employer. Yeah. yeah. There's. The employee doesn't have an automatic, I could come back anytime I want to and expect to be employed. Another interesting issue is if you wanted to somehow tie that into the statement of faith. So, you know, impairment. It, it gets tricky because then you're talking about, well, you know, a, pretty savvy lawyer would be able to attack that if if someone's on pain pills that or have a pain condition and they're, they're taking prescription medications or if you don't take the same view of alcohol things like that. Really marijuana has this, the status of alcohol now I would think. Um, and one other thing to be aware of, I was thinking of this when I was going over this is marijuana has different impacts on the brain, depending on how it's ingested. And so um, Maureen Dowd is, I think she was like, she's a New York Times editorial writer. I remember back, this always stood out to me, back when, I think Colorado was the first state to legal, legalize recreational marijuana. So right after that happened, I guess she was traveling there and so wanted to try it. And so she did an edible and I, you could probably look it up online. It was a funny article. She, she ate like a Snickers bar or equivalent of whatever it is. And she thought she had died because the, the potency of the edibles is really high. And its impact on the user is more of a psychedelic impact than like smoking. So, um, so she was having this like major psychedelic episode and had ingested so much that it was very severe. 
and she was like, yeah, I thought I had died. Like in her mind, she had like died. <laughs> so you can have like, so if you're back to the impairment, if, if somebody is like showing like psychedelic type impairment, it still could be marijuana. So interesting. So just looking ahead, like I said, it's, it's kind of, it's got the status of, of alcohol almost. The, the stigma is almost completely dropped away. If you look at the, I mean, over my lifetime, I remember when I went to law school, I was like blown away by how many people smoked pot. It just seems so weird to me because I did not come from that background. And I was like, wow, it's a lot of people. Um, so it's even more accepted. That was the, that was the late 90s. Um, more of the workplace, I, you know, probably not necessarily in the religious sector, religious organizations, but it could become a hiring stumbling block at some point. Another just quick story. So I was doing a medical marijuana, recreational marijuana um, presentation about a year ago for a nonprofit, but it was secular. And we were preparing, we, like it was remote, so I was like logging in and we were getting everything set up and different windows open with different employees. And you know, this, I know that one of them was in charge and then there was another employee and she's like, oh yeah, I take my edibles every night to help me go to sleep. And it was just like, you know, her supervisor's right there. It was just like, I was like, wow, different world. So um, it's going to be more common. And as it becomes more common, it may be difficult to find, you know, to, it may become a stumbling block to hiring people if, if that's an important issue for you. So <laughs> decrease in card holders as recreational laws go into effect. And this, this guy, he just has red eyes. That's why I just put him up there. Um, and then federal de decriminalization is right around the corner. So that's it for the 2022 handbook update. Uh, if you, that's my email if you have questions. And any questions about anything we covered? Out about 13 minutes early, I hear some rumbling from the other room, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've only been at the church two years, but the manual is so outdated. When a new person comes in, I mean, I'm trying to redo it. Um, do I say, hold off because I'm redoing this, or do I give up this totally illegal handbook? I mean, it, it's really, I mean, nothing in there is legal in California that I've read so far. I've heard I wouldn't give it to them if you're if you know there are provisions that are counter to California law. Like we can't do the use it or lose it. And yeah. 